So, uh, good evening, everybody. Good morning for people in Europe like me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shaw and, and Michael, for the invitation. I'm really very uh, glad to for the opportunity of presenting our work in, in this in this uh, conference. This is a very imp impressive conference. It's a pity that I missed most of that because of the time difference. But I'm looking forward to, uh, to watch the recording afterwards. Right now, we're in a situation that, uh, uh, look at the process that we have after photo excitation of a molecule. You can do lots of things from, from simple vibrational relaxation, fluorescence, phosphorescence, and all these things happen in very different time scales. And it's really a, a wide range of time scales. At the situation now, you have good methods to treat things that are in the, uh, maybe uh, from few a few femtoseconds to a few picoseconds. You can use full quantum mechanics in more strict uh, time scale. You can use uh, mixed quantum classical dynamics uh, for a few picoseconds. But then you have a, a huge range of time scales that you don't really have good methods that are tailored to deal with the process happening there. You saw uh, Igor uh, today talking about rhodopsin. Uh, that's something that happens, uh, isomerization take, takes place into, uh, within one picosecond. And, but that's excited by laser. You excite, if you excite rhodopsin with a solar radiation, real sunlight, so we are going to talk about microsecond processes. That's really one million times longer than what you get with a laser. How can you simulate those things? So that's the discussion I want to bring today. I want to discuss now about dynamics in a, non, uh, in a long time scale. My name is Mario Barbati. I'm a professor of, the, of chemistry at the Ex Marseille University uh, at the Institute of, uh, of Radical Chemistry, Marseille, and also a member of the Institute Université de France. And in Marseille, I lead a, a research group that's dedicated to developing methods for mixed quantum classical dynamics, and they are Recently, you have the proposed different methods for, for instance, open quantum systems, uh, system excited by incoherent light, problem, uh, methods involve machine learning usage, methods for computing uh, uh, couplings without wave functions to dealing with uh, zero point energy leakage. That's something that I'm going to talk a little bit more later today and even a new theory to do and predict the temperature of micro, uh, microcanonic finite quantum systems. Then you take these methods, implement them in a set of software that may be the best well known is the Newton X software for, for, for dynamics. And we use these methods and software for applications in photo process in a, most of our, uh, in a grand, large variety of fields. I would like already to, to thank uh, the, uh, my group, at the left, the people currently in the group, and the, the right people that were there too recently. So I'm very glad for, for working for all those people. And um, most of them participating one way or other of the work that I'm going to show here today. Most of the process that you discuss when you're talking about dynamics, you excite the molecule and then you have a set of crossings and you have the internal conversions and you're talking about picoseconds. That's what you see most of the time. That's what I do most of the time. But it's enough to have a triplet state and then you move from the picosecond to the nanosecond scale. And you don't even need to have a triplet state. Maybe it's just a weak coupling between two singlet states like Jordan angles, those people discussed long ago. And now we're again talking about nanoseconds and have even competitions between very different pathways, like competition between the internal conversion and the fluorescence. And if you have uh, the triplet again, then things get worse because they may be talking about microseconds of, of the phosphorescence. And then I need methods for to dealing with these things. People have been started to look at this, at, 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 at how to do these things. And for instance, Akimov, uh, 
2017. He uh, he discussed that in the context of uh, of analytical model that could really propagate for a very long time. And uh, Julia and and Philip Marquetin they worked in 2019 to show that you could use machine learning potentials to extend the the the, the, the propagation. I have done something like myself with the propagation uh, used by incoherent light. Uh, Stephen Lopes again came back with the idea of using machine learning potential to extend the dynamics. Uh, together with Hans Lischke, uh, my group uh, explored the ergodic hypothesis to be able to make long time simulations to make uh, uh, to 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 check the the, the fluorescence of uh, of a parin. And you also discussed how you get there. And this last paper here is the, the basis for this talk today. So what do you want for a long time scale method? You should consider three things. Three things. Uh, first, the method should consider all nuclear degrees of freedom. Then you want a method that can be applied to any type of molecule. And that's obvious because the primary advantage of using dynamics is that dynamics shows non-trivial pathways, much beyond our chemical intuition. If you use dynamics and reduce the dimensionality, it loses this advantage. That's exactly what you don't want to do. And the best way of doing dynamics in full dimensionality is using mixed quantum classical methods because it's intrinsically encoded there. The third feature that we want for a long time scale method is that it should not require much more computational resources than we use today. And the reason for that is the following. If you do surface hopping, for instance, the total time that it takes to do surface hopping is the number of trajectories uh, you want to compute times the number of single points you need in each trajectory times the time that you need to compute each single point. The number of single points is, is uh, the time of the process, like uh, one picosecond, one nanosecond, divided by the integration time step, delta tau. If I plug in this uh, equation, uh, uh, these numbers, 100 trajectories, each single point at 0.1 CPU hour, I want to simulate half a nanosecond, a time step of half a second, that's going to cost me 10 mega CPU hours. In France, I pay 0.02 cents of euro per, per CPU hour, which means that this pro project is going to cost me 200,000 euros. It's a huge amount of money, I can't afford that. And even if you can afford that, you shouldn't do it because of the carbon footprint of, of this project. One CPU hour at, uh, with 32 gigabytes of memory is going to be given at 1.3 grams of uh, CO2. 10 mega CPU hours make 13 tons of CO2. Just to give a comparison, one French person consumes 11 or 12 tons of CO2 per year. So my project is going to cost the same as one, ooh, one person per year. And that's in France where the, 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 the energy is very clean. If I go to other countries, I have to change that, this, this calculation. Brazil is going to be twice that in UK seven times can be 14 times in China, so should be careful. So this is the three things I want for my method. But then it comes the question, what's long time scale anyway? I didn't define a long time scale. So let's be a little bit more precise about that. That's my, 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 my time scale. I have methods until a few picoseconds. I want to go longer than that. So let's suppose I want to go longer than 10 picoseconds. If I integrate this with 0.1 femtoseconds, I would say that long time scale for me is any dynamics with over 100,000 time steps. I work with this number, 100,000 time steps, and define this as long time scale. And uh, the characteristic time step for integrating the Newton equation is given by more or less by this equation here. There's one tenth of the minimum of this function of delta R divided delta A. This uh, uh, delta R is the relative distance between the pair of nuclei. Delta A is the relative acceleration between them. And if you apply this equation to a harmonic oscillator, this is going to give me uh, one over F, one over the frequency. Or if you apply that for the gravitational motion, that's going to give you something that depends on the mass uh, of the system. 
Then let's make some estimates for a molecule. My fast frequency is about 3000 away the numbers. And again, for 0.1 uh, femtosecond uh, integration time step, I'm going to say that my long time scale is to be able to integrate over 10 picoseconds of dynamics. If I take a regular object that's vibrating, like a pendulum is vibrating at one hertz, uh, and I want to integrate to point, point 0.01 second, that's what I need to do there. Then my uh, long time scale means to be able to predict the motion of these pendulums for over 16 minutes. If I go for a gravitational system, then my delta tau is about 100 hours, and I want to be able to integrate my orbital motion for over 1,100 years. So now you have, can have some idea what's what I'm calling long time scale here. So how do you get there? You must face uh, a few different challenges. The extreme cost reduction, the stability of the integration, the accuracy of the, uh, of the, of the method and the software optimization to, to reach there. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these starting from the extreme cost reduction. And there are different strategies that you can do to reach the, the cost reduction. You can start with a parameterized quantum chemistry, so semi-empirical. You take a method like a formal CI from Paris and Granucci or M2CI from Thiel, or the method from Tretiak Group, the FTB, time-dependent Conchamp from Akimov and Prejdu. All these are great methods. They are fast, they are general, they are full dimensional. They are really good for, for, for long time scale dynamics. The problem is that they have many issues with accuracy and parameterization. I don't discard them, but they, you should use very careful, carefully. Second strategy is to use a model Hamiltonians, like I mentioned that Akimov used it in his work in 2017. And a model Hamiltonian can be a simple model Hamiltonian, like this uh, adiabatic spin boson where you have explicit equations to integrate your dynamics. And this model here is great. You can do a dynamics for two states with many dimensions and you can do avoided crosses. You can do sloped conic intersections. You can do wicked coupled uh, uh, states, but still is a very low flexibility Hamiltonian. and it won't allow you to do much. You can go uh, to linear vibration coupling. Uh, Felix did that a couple of years ago. It get, got uh, great results, but still have the issue of parameterization. The best uh, have now is this work by, uh, from the group of Santoro, where they, um, uh, they fitted the linear vibration coupling for pyrene that has 72 dimensions. They managed to fit 45 dimensions and seven states. That's the state of the art of this fitting now. The third strategy would be to go to machine learning potentials like uh, uh, Julia Westmeyer, Marketan, and, and Steve Lopez have been doing. And that's a good option because right now, machine learning potentials are well developed. You look at this, uh, this benchmark for, for the MD, MD17 database, and you see that they're getting very good accuracy in the, in the prediction forces. It's really well below 1K per mole. And if you're not happy with what you're here, we you see here, just increase your, your, your training set and you can get from 1,000 points to 10,000 to 50,000. You'll see that most of machine learning potentials can give very precise energy for the ground state. The situation isn't as comfortable when you go to the excited state. In the excited states, there are many issues yet. The, 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 you're still working out trying to get accurate potentials. So we're still at not the level of the, of the ground state. So you see these are the main uh, strategies that you can have to for cost reduction. Probably you have to work with a bit of each one, depending on uh, case to case. The second point you have to face is the stability of integration. And there you have two points to look at. First, the performance of the integration, ZPE spilling. Concerning the performance of the integration, that's something that usually you don't worry so much as just assuming that it works well because you're integrating in short scales. But let's see what happens in one picosecond if you integrate velocity really with 0.01 femtosecond. It's a wonderful result. You see that the error in the total energy is in the, in the 10 to the minus 7 heart rate, nothing. If I increase my time step to 0.5 femtoseconds, that's usually what I do as a routine then my error is in the order of uh, tenths of a milli, milli heart rate, still acceptable. And it's good because constant is not the, the great of time. 
But here I'm assuming that my model is perfect, it's full accuracy. But you know, every quantum chemical method is going to have some uh, limit in accuracy. And let's suppose that this limit is 10 to the minus seven. I just put a random force acting every time step, making a change of 10 to the minus seven in my, in my, in my gradient. That's in, in hard to bore. It doesn't change much, it's fine. Now let's increase this error to, from 10 to the minus seven atomic units to 10 to the minus five atomic units. Look what happened to the total energy. It just completely degrades. I don't have any information anymore in my system. So if you want to go for the, the long time scale, you see that you have a hard, uh, a hard restriction of 10 to the minus five heart per bore in the accuracy of your mass. So what's really restricted? ZPE is another problem that you don't look very often, but it's there. The ZP spilling every time that you are using a method that's based on classical dynamics, if you have a hot degree like the OH vibration, this dimer, and you have a soft degree like this uh, dimer vibration, you may have an artificial transfer of energy from, from the hot to the cold. And this is going to cause a dissociation of your dimer that's completely artificial. You know that very well. People have been discussing uh, this for decades. The big names in dynamics like Miller, Hase, Boma, Varandas, all of them discussed how to, dis how to solve the CP CPE prob problem. And most of the methods proposed depend on calculation of Hessian. That's kind of a bad for us doing on the fly dynamics. Recently, uh, Mukherjee and I proposed the local pair ZP correction that works monitoring pair of atoms. And because of that, it doesn't require any hashing. It, it works like a thermostate. It transfers the energy, kinetic energy from, from the slow vibrational modes to the fast uh, vibrational modes every time that you have a drop in the ZP. And as a place, it, it conserves energy, momentum, angular momentum. So it's simple. It's just like that to define your, your bond pairs. You don't even need to be bond. It's just atom pairs you run the dynamics to, to, to get how much energy you have initially in, in, in each pair and use this quantity here, this epsilon k0, as a measurement of, of, your, of how much energy you must keep in your system during the dynamics. Then during the dynamics, you compute this average again and compare. And every time that you have a delta that's smaller than a certain parameter, predefined parameter, you apply this, the correction that consists of rescaling the velocity in the in the intermolecular direction. And this is a simple equation that are just going to heat up the fast degree, the AH. And you have a set of equivalent equations to cool down the, the soft degrees, the BC. And this, in this way, you are going to get your conservation of total energy, angular momentum, and linear momentum. You apply. Uh, you make dynamics without ZP corrections, you get the dissociation, that's the, the bold curve here. There's all distance between in the dimer. You apply the correction and now you have the right behavior without any dissociation. Uh, I can hear your sound. Mario, Mario, we couldn't hear you. Hello. <laughs> uh, oh. I I sent it to the end, but uh, no. Oh yeah, maybe he's trying.
Let's Something, something happened. Hi, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Yeah, sorry. I, I was speaking here and I missed it. I have no idea what was the last thing that you heard. Can you go back one <laughs> slide? That should be enough. Uh, this one here? Oh, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, I don't know what happened. I'm sorry for that. Um, so I, I just ran out of time. So I have to, to speed up here. I was talking about the accuracy of the methods. And so I was just wanted to, to tell you that when you go for surface hopping, for instance, you have to do very harsh, harsh approximations that may be not valid in, in a long time scale. If you apply it, for instance, for the weak coupling regime, you have to propagate several picoseconds, many picoseconds. You may have problems. Right now, the comparison between MCTDH and surface hopping is fine, but you are not really we're still we're still testing that. You still have a long way to go to be sure that you can use those methods, even MCTDH, because also not prepared for for the long time scale. You have to be sure that you are doing the right thing there. Finally, soft optimization. That's the last challenge that you must face. And here we're talking about the fast processing, handling big data, and complying with open data requirements. That's the things that we have to check out. Uh, in Marseille, we developed the Newton X platform. That's a surface hopping program that, that's free, where you can just get it that phone for newtonx.org. And you can use them, do dynamic with many different methods. And uh, you are really right in Newton X from scratch. You have a new version that's called Newton, S, uh, Newton X NES for a new series, where we wrote the core loop of the program. You optimize the development environment and are complying with a new open data standards and are keeping uh, the previous fun functionalities of the program. Right now, we have two parallel versions of Newton X, Newton X CS, that's the classical C uh, series, and Newton X NES, they are surviving parallel to each other. And the Newton X NCS was quite much inspired by Columbus. Uh, it was a mix, uh, uh, a match of uh, Perl and Fortran. And now Newton X NES is pure Fortran, which means that it's much, much, much faster. For instance, if you do this uh, simulation for, for this, that takes four, five hours with, with this Newton X CS, in Newton X NES, it drops to 11 minutes. So it's 2000 times difference of the, or, or in integration. Here it's extreme case because analytical model that's integrated inside the binary. If you do, uh, if you call external pro uh, programs, uh, the, the gain is not so much. But anyway, you have a lot of gain. You moved to H5 MG format. That's one type of ADF5. It's a data structure compressed, very fast portable and self-contained way of, of writing, writing data. And you gain a lot for the long time scale. For the short time scale, you compare the, 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 the dash to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the green, the blue to the green, you don't see much gain. You can keep using a uh, text format, form, formatted file that you don't gain much. But for the, for, for the long time scale, you get a lot of gain using ADF5, both in size and writing time. And your, our data now is open. You can get our data sets. They are supposed to be searchable, auditable, and reproducible. That's not, it's, it's for everything, not only for the time scale, it's for everything. So what's coming next, just to finish, you see uh, there are many non adiabatic phenomena happening at a long time scale. And you may expect a publication rush in this field. It's coming. Machine learning might be the goal to, to, to the tool to go there being the driving force for the new generation of methods. And we are computing benchmarks, developing methods, proposing protocols, and rewriting Newton X to deal with this new demand. So you can already get Newton X NES, a beta, a beta version from, from GitLab. And 
With that, I would like to finish that. Thank you, uh, Max Pinheiro, who is responsible for the machine learning integrity stability uh, project in the group. Shakat Mukherjee, who is responsible for implementation of ZP corrections and the discussion of, uh, of, of the accuracy of the, of, of the dynamics. Baptiste de Moulin, who is implementing it on XNES. And so thank you very much for, for the invitation, for your kind attention. Sorry for the technical problems. And if you still have time, we'll be happy to answer any question. Thanks for that talk. And uh, do you have any question? Okay. I know oh. that I'm the, the only thing between you and the dinner, so. Uh, Mario, thanks for a very nice talk and uh, sort of outlining all the challenges with the long time dynamics. Uh, uh, what it would be the uh, point where at some point probably you don't want to dynamics at all, right? So because you will, system will reach the equilibrium, right? So, I mean, and uh, you're probably better off with some type of like, I don't know, RRKM theory or maybe sampling just potential energy surfaces without actually propagating trajectories. So what do you think would be that limit for most of the system or for, I mean, can we, can we figure out the limit when we should should, shouldn't try to extend dynamic beyond certain time scale basically and start thinking about some type of statistical approach basically Sergey, uh, that's that's really a great question and i don't have an answer for that i believe that should be maybe case by case because the advantage of dynamics over rate theory is that you, you it's the discovery uh, power you discover new reaction pathways that you never thought that were there before and when you go for rate theory, you have a rate to impose some bias decide what your reaction path, your, your transition states, for instance. So I think you depend on case to case where you're already sure that you don't have anything new happening there or not. We did a, a recent work now on, on, on uh, uh, fluorescence of a pyrene that was essential to use dynamics because then you could see the thermal activation of them of the states that if you went uh, through rate theory, you would have to impose that. So case to case. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you for the nice summarizing talk. Uh, I have one question about your the machine learning potential error estimation. So you showed that the ground state estimation has a, a much smaller energy error, but the excited state has much bigger error. Why is it that different? It's just energy estimation, and I don't, I, I, I can't see a reason why uh, the excited state has a, a, a demerit there. And another related question is: Do you have some sense of the size of the error bars on the non-adiabatic coupling thing? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, that that's a good question, and and. Uh, one problem that you have here is that when they show this benchmark, this benchmark is used use the MD17 database. That's a ground state database. It's, it's prepared with ah. dynamics in a ground state with the, with the FT. So it's basically a harmonic oscillator. When you go mm -hmm. to excited states that's deeply unharmonic and couple for the states, the surface are more, much more difficult to predict. And the ground state is always very much harmonic. That's the main difference in the error. Concerning your second question, I don't really have a good, a, a good answer. Because right now we have been using uh, TDBA, this back end approach that doesn't that that you that computes the coupling out of the of, of the time derivative of the of of, of the energy gap. Mm -hmm. So we're not really looking at the coupling because the coupling is really a complicated thing to 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 predict. We have indication that you can do well, but errors similar to the errors that you have in the gradient, not better, not much worse. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's finish the session. Uh, thanks, thanks for the last talk. Okay? Thanks, Mario. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shaw. Okay. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's also thank all the speakers uh, today's talk. Okay, then the, let's switch to the real life. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh...
Okay. Okay. I think I that, think that we, uh, you guys survived. And I think that uh, for right now is a five. So we could, uh, uh, we could take some time. Okay. And maybe uh, uh, if you're ready, we could go for dinner. Uh, take your time. So maybe uh, 10 or 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. And uh, we'll go all together today. And today is a closer than yesterday. And so we could go all together and come back. Okay. So, uh, oh, also, I need to tell you about tomorrow uh, plan. Uh, we will leave. Uh, a big bus will come right in front of this building, and that bus will leave at 9 a.m. So please, there before that. <laughs> oh, that's a big, oh. I think the third floor. And uh, there will be 9 a.m. in the morning. You will not miss one big bus. <laughs> if you do, then maybe something. <laughs> yeah.